just published a paper. She was here in my study in 200 people perspective over two years in pre-diabetics with um, the non saltburg fraction from oat fiber. Uh, people got 15 grams per day, and in previous studies we had shown that this improved insulin sensitivity, and this decreased HbA1c significantly, a little bit only, but significant, but it reduced diabetes by 45% in those 200 people. So, my, well, I hope I spoke loud enough. <laughs> so, the, the point would be, actually, as, should I start again? <laughs> so the, the point would be that actually wouldn't it be worthwhile to turn more to the non solvent fraction because actually David uh, Joff Lifts, that he was here, has very nice reviews where he shows that it's a non-soluble fiber and it's, it's not soluble fiber from fruits and legumes and so on which prevent diabetes. So I, th I think the situation actually is quite strongly supported by the literature and your talks also and supported those views. There you go, Vlad, you're a okay. I'm, I'm the brave one. I mean, we are aware of your miraculous study. You are the only one showing insoluble fiber, Jeff, obviously, with meta-analysis. We, by the way, did meta-analysis with insoluble fiber. So whatever you see, we did with insoluble. I must tell you, we did not see much. Um, if, we, if we do fair meta-analysis, then John Piper, who kind of tortured us with methodology, uh, I didn't see him a couple of weeks, must be changed already. Uh, so, so uh, you know, there was, I'll give you an example, a couple of Iranian studies that uh, Jeff is uh, probably put them in. Uh, if you put them in, then insoluble fiber effect show some cholesterol and something like that. But, you know, you, you, you know, this... Diabetes as well, you know. So basically, there are some studies that you, by methodology or meta analysis, you have to put in. But when you look at the literature, you will see example that particular studies from from Iran. They did, did one study reported twice, for example, and we contact them and they say, "Sorry, we just did," and we did different results. Anyway, we thought we'll exclude. When we exclude, there is no effect in soluble fiber in many of these factors. So what I'm saying, what Jim was saying, I'm not sure what is meta-analysis, meta-analysis. Meta if you really can exclude, according to John, you can't, then you get Jeff results. If you exclude them, which I think we should, uh, then you don't. Anyway, I agree should be more studies, but we, we in our group, we never seen any kind of effect on postprandial glycemia of insoluble fiber. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, you want me to say something? Yeah, I want to say something. Well, it sounds like everybody wants to say something. So I'm... Is this, is this probably on, I think. Yeah. Put it up to your mouth. Well, I could shout anyway, so I usually do. Um, so, I mean, I guess the first thing that I was going to say was to say something on behalf of somebody who's not here. And that is if John Cummings, whom I regard as a major international authority on dietary fiber, was here, he'd say this is a stupid conversation because, in fact, methodology is such that to try and distinguish between soluble and insoluble fiber particularly if you're talking about epidemiological studies, is probably inappropriate. I mean, certainly my interpretation of this, as long as it's been going on, is that actually uh, there's huge variation in the data between soluble and insoluble fiber. And I, I honestly think that perhaps we spend too much time, if we're concerned about general health outcomes, including diabetes, of arguing the toss between soluble and insoluble, and it's probably more helpful to look at total dietary fiber. Yeah, so I mean, soluble and insoluble, I'm, we probably were partly responsible for those terms. Probably viscous and non-viscous is more important for the acute effects. But I think if, 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 if colonic fermentation is important, I mean, the, the gut is a, is a very complex ecosystem, and these things take months and months to change. And I know, I mean, you know, just we all like to cite our own data, so it's like one of ours. We did a one-year-long trial in people who had, a, who had IGT, or at least were obese in Britain. Uh, where we fed wheat bran, wheat fiber versus Rice Krispies, all brown cereal, for a year. And, it, and we could see a significant time interaction with the effect on butyrate concentration in blood and um, GLP-1. So after one year, the wheat fiber, I think this, the gut will adapt and the bacteria will grow, who will, which will ferment fiber, right? And, and it takes a long time for that to occur and you can see an effect and maybe that's an important thing. And I, 
I think we need much longer trials of fiber if we're looking at diabetes prevention. I mean, that study was not powered for that. Um, but uh, in the control group of 15, there was no reduction in postprandial glucose at one year, whereas in the intervention group, there was a reduction from the beginning control when you fed the same foods. So, uh, you know, I Alan, think the Alan total Mark. fiber, I agree with Jim, total fiber is, is, a, is, a, is an important thing. I, I think if you want to do separate eyes, it's probably more helpful to talk about foods than soluble and insoluble fiber. Could I comment just on that? I think that non-soluble fiber has one big advantage. A major reason why people do not eat soluble fiber is gas. And non-soluble fiber is not fermented. The second thing is non-soluble fiber does not change acute postprandial responses of glucose. But in the long term, it decreases or it improves insulin sensitivity. And it changes, for instance, bile acids, which is probably related to microbiota. Right. I thought, uh, if I may, uh, response to that, that's at my commentary. If I recall that uh, back in 2006 or seven, that Jim, that you convened that uh, expert panel on behalf of WHO on dietary carbohydrate. I think our recommendation is to do away the definition of soluble and insoluble. I mean, that's totally based on a chemical assay uh, to define, but in, in, in reality, it's not how sort of interacting with the body that we actually classify, or there's even a chemical structure that allow you to classify insoluble versus soluble fiber, right? So if you chase all the way back to the original uh, definition of dietary fiber, it's, it ought to be the plant cell wall. So in other words, it's the cell wall with the whole thing that involved, that's the major unique distinction between plant-based product versus animal-based product is they got the cell, have cell walls in it. And the cell wall itself has a lot of things aside from the polymer, basically. I don't think that regardless of any studies or you do, you can actually separate them. Yes, but there is, there is a lot of conf confusion on this. Eh? That was addressed in the Dietary Fiber Conference just a month ago. I mean, globally, the, the definition of dietary fiber is now degree of polymerization of 3M+. Plus, yeah? And that is because so much prebiotics, uh, oligosaccharides, have come into the picture. And if people start adding these, the industry is driving in, uh, research to, to get answers. And then they try to characterize these with specific characteristics like being soluble or, or insoluble or viscous. And there's a lot of misunderstanding there. Uh, Andreas, you just said insoluble are not uh, fermented, but that's, but that's not true, of course. Resistant starch is insoluble, but is 100% is, is fermented. If you take oat fiber, non-soluble, it's not yeah. very much fermented. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so we, we should characterize, and, and I would like to say one thing here, and, and, and it's a point to, to, to Thomas and to Jim too. If you say, well, you look at, at viscous fibers, then very often fibers are assumed to be viscous, and very seldom they are measured and characterized, and they are pulled, and that explains that so many studies have diverse effects in the outcomes because they may be viscous or they may be assumed viscous but not viscous. So having said that, I would like to go to, there was a question there. Ellen could, could I just comment on that comment? Because uh, I think Jim brought it up that the, there's the viscosity, the molecular, the fiber, but there's also it's able to be released into the intestine in form of viscous and we would call that solubility if you like. And of course, as you grind up oats, Okay, you make the starch more digestible, maybe, but you then release the beta glucan and it's more bioavailable as well. So the interaction between these would be interesting to study. Yes, yeah, to expand a little bit on the, that discussion of, uh, of type of dietary fibers, there also are some uh, recent indications that the side of fermentation may be very important also for metabolic effects. That when you ferment in a more proximal colon or distal colon, may affect metabolic health because at the distal colon, for instance, fermentation products may reach more the systemic circulation. When you ferment more proximal, it may be extracted by the, by the liver. So uh, in all those nice overviews, uh, 
Don't you think that we have to take more into account than the total uh, uh, dietary uh, composition or a mixture of more uh, easily digestible and complex digestible carbohydrates? Because that may make some difference. Perhaps like, you can comment on that. Just a quick one. I mean, most meta-analysis that we did most recently uh, on viscous, viscous, we're not talking about soluble, soluble, they are viscous, they are viscous of viscosoluble fiber, five, six, seven, whatever you find, it's against control. In most cases, it was insoluble fiber. And, and in most of these fiber, especially more viscous, Tom Oliver, most viscous, you will see the effect. So control is, Andreas, control is insoluble fiber. And most of my analysis are showing good results on behalf of viscous. Yeah. I just want to make a comment. Um, pectin, which is considered a viscous fiber, if you actually see it in the plant itself, it's thought to be a mega macromolecule and that it exists from the root tip to the um, hypocotyl, to the top of the plant. So when we eat it, we're only eating a very small amount, but also when you consider um, the extraction, you will never ever get a true representation of pectin in any plant. It's a great discussion. To me, the interesting thing is the difference that we've seen so often between cohort studies and randomized control trials. My feeling about this, and perhaps I'm going to be wrong, Vlad will tell me, um, is that the cohort studies come out very favorably in fiber in general, serial fiber specifically, um, in terms of being protective for cardiovascular disease um, and also for diabetes. The, yet, yet we don't have those sort of data from randomized control trials, and we don't find a great deal of anything happening with so-called insoluble fibers. And I don't, I like the term viscous too, Tom, so I'm with you on viscosity. Um, but we don't find a great deal that would, would guarantee us some sort of success. For example, I mean, <coughs> Jim mentioned that probably oats were only about 25% of the, of the fiber. It's the cereal fiber that we're talking about is predominantly wheat. Um, and yet wheat seems to be protective of these things. And I don't see the physiological mechanism by which this happens. Perhaps the rest of you understand this better. What is the physiological reason why cereal fiber, wheat fiber, not just oats, but wheat fiber seem to have some protective effect? Is it because we're talking about the nature of the people who take whole wheat bread? Is it something to do with right. the, the dietary pattern that people follow? Or is it due to the dietary components? Well, I mean, I think the short answer, David, as you well know, is that we don't actually know. And I come back to saying, I mean, I think this distinction between different types of fi dietary fiber are very difficult. I mean, if it's any consolation to you to know, I was, had the misfortune to be one of a very small number of people who spent something like two weeks continuously trying to come up with what is currently the WHO codex definition. And we went round and round and round in Margaret Bush, and we never were able to come to any conclusion other than what the definition now is, which is dietary fibre. And if you want to talk about subtypes of dietary fibre, you can talk about sources of dietary fibre. And we reviewed that situation relatively recently, and we went round and round the mulberry bush for almost as long as we did the time before, and came up with precisely the same conclusion. So that's point number one. Point number two, I think very importantly, when you look at those, those prospective epidemiological studies, and I think of the first one, and Simon was involved in this uh, from the nurses' health study, I think it was, which came up with serial fiber, serial fiber protective against diabetes. And then I think it's important to remember that the bulk of dietary fiber comes from that source, not from what you describe as the soluble fiber. So, I mean, that might well be the average, uh, in the average population, the, cons the, the total consumption of the soluble fiber, to use your terminology, is very small by comparison with the insoluble fiber. And that may explain at least some of the difference. But that's as much as I can offer now. Right, so I wanted to add two points. Number one is from the perspective of biology. To think about this completely from a biological perspective. It seems to me this concept of dietary fiber, again, involves two things. One is the bioaccessibility. 
which is get back to the point about when it got, you know, the ADME, where actually it happens. It's an accessibility issue. Number two is, of course, the bioavailability. So when you eat the products, well, I'm just thinking about all this epidemiology fighting that, in fact, in my view, some of the epidemiology uh, fighting has been fairly consistent, at least prospectively. Uh, and not only one study now, multiple studies have consistently shown uh, a direct inverse relationship with diabetes or cardiometabolic outcomes of interest. However, uh, David, you're right, so we can never get at whether or not it's just this, this behavioral association you see rather than something is truly causal, right? So you can never get past that until you do a, a trial, which I still think that we, we need to do. Our community really need to come together and do that trial. In fact, that's something that you have, under your leadership, several of your groups of uh, key players have been trying to do, right? Even your portfolio diet, that, that critical component the contribution to our field to really put nutrition on the map uh, in this kind of medical therapeutic paradigm is because you have a trial to show that in fact this food-based portfolio diet actually works based on the biochemical marker you pick, right, LDL. So I think now there's going to be I don't think this would change. It's this large inconsistency or large heterogeneity across different study designs in terms of the food they use or the, uh, the characteristics of the population. So ultimately, we still need that trial to look at the outcome to determine whether or not there is a causal effect. But that said, I have offered uh, you know, you, you use our own examples of doing this work. There's many pieces of information where we can piece them together. For example, genetic is one way to do that. Why? Because ultimately the ADME, right? This is the uh, absorption, digestion, digestions, metabolisms, and excretion. The entire processes are essentially genetically regulated. So if we can get at some of these uh, uh, DNA codes that code for the protein, some of the enzymes, for example, some of the enzyme inhibitors, that whatnot, then you can actually see some signals that allow that, in, that would be informative. And I think that's one way to do it. And if that is in, consistent with some of the perturbations, the small trial, where you look at completely different endpoint of interest, like even HbA1c short term, to me, means very little. I mean, HbA1c ought to be representative of a three month average glycemic control. And some of the trials that only last six weeks, and you see that you expect to have a HbA1c differences, it's, it's also lovable. Right? So there's a lot of problem in this kind of study design, the way I see it. And ultimately, we need to do a trial, just like the Women's Health Initiative. Uh, if you don't do it, you never have the answer. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for the group. Great, great talks, but it has to do with beta cell function. There are various reports about fiber affecting, having salutary effects on beta cell function. And I'm interested to know what your consensus is. Is it a direct effect, effect or more likely is it indirect uh, via an incretin based L cell microbiome, propionate butyrate trophic effects and insulin resistance and some complex uh, integrative physiologic effect. But nevertheless, it's an observable phenomenon with fiber and beta cell. And it would be very important for us as clinicians to understand this, particularly as we have patients with uh, dysglycemia entering into an insulinopenic phase? I don't think we have, I think it's an excellent question. I don't think we have the faintest idea, but maybe some others have the faintest idea, I think. Well, I mean, if you suggest, I mean, it's probably a combination of all sorts of things. I mean, in the acute situation, if you can delay carbohydrate absorption, you know, you suppress free fatty acids and that, you know, that could reduce fatty acid fat in the beta cell. Um, with our, our low GI diet studies in diabetes, I mean, we tended to find a beta cell function increase uh, it, when you, and, and uh, we did, we, we did it when an IGT with FSIGTT and the multiplication of the sensitivity in the beta cell, the insulin area was the disposition index was improved. 
So I don't know how that is. It could be if we get fermentation and GLP-1 secretion, that could be an Im impact. It could be a, a number of things. Um, but, right. uh, I mean, I guess the point is rather than this just being a casual association of fiber uh, having improvements in metrics, wouldn't it be to our advantage to understand the mechanism? Because these subtle nuanced effects, I mean, if you look at the, the data, a lot of these are very nuanced effects. They reach statistical significance by p-values, but they may not be clinically relevant at face value, but there could be so much gain in the physiologic system, uh, and it fits, it's, it's consistent with the way biological systems work, that these very small, non-trivial, but very small uh, changes could actually be amplified into clinically significant physiologic effects. Yeah, I mean, there's small effects on body weight, which is going to have a whole series of, there's a whole bunch of effects, yeah. Right. So as long as you have a glycemic effect, right, uh, Jeff, you know, I mean, it's already in textbooks, the glucose toxicity. We do know that when glucose being uh, uh, suppressed, um, you can actually regain some beta cell function, right, in, among people with diabetes. Same thing with dyslipidemia. I think that's a, that's a well-established physiological fact. That's, that said, in terms of nutrition, I think focus simply on fiber. I mean, I, again, fiber is a term that is, it should not be purely chemical, right, from a nutritional perspective. And that's the reason why Jim would recall at that committee that we have so such a, a, a difficulty to reach a consensus uh, until we come up with this concept of not only chemical purity, but also nutritional. And that's, I think, is consistent with the idea of glycemic index all along, traced back to the original hypothesis or the original dietary hypothesis. Really is a nutritional concept, not a chemical one. Yeah, I mean, whenever you use, I Still talking about viscous fiber, Tom, uh, you know, you see lower glucose, lower insulin. That's the dream of the, of the treatment if you eat carbohydrate food. And, you know, and, and if you do, it, for example, medication, metformin, if you give before a meal, which I don't know how diabetes give, you can see this post glycemia. Nobody does this. And when they see this, they say these are cool. I mean, with the with a, with a incretin, uh, you know, you are supposed, if you have fiber, again, viscous, or let's say insoluble, there, there is a slow gastric emptying. So everybody in this field, GLP-1, and this will say, this is what you want because we'll, we'll come and, and tickle more these L cells and you will get most, more a, uh, a GLP-1 and, and other stuff. However, it's not. I mean, we have studies in Toronto which, which we're trying to write up and, and I even ask um, um, our superstar GLP-1 guy in Toronto. Um, and we cannot either. When you have fiber, actually GLP-1 is lower. It's not secreting easily. Easily is lower, GLP-1. So what I'm trying to say, I don't know what I'm trying, we have to do more studies. But you know, GLP-1, if you want to increase it, which would be cool, are expensive. You don't have money in nutrition. But I think you can do, and last point, what is the beauty of fiber if you if select one? It's polytropic. And this is what is diabetes, because I'm not going to say who cares for beta cells. You care for beta cells, you care for blood, blood pressure, you care for, for cholesterol, you care for it. And this is what fiber, good fiber does. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the effect of uh, oat consumption on weight is insignificant or uh, modest, at least. Do you think that it can be explained, at least, uh, at least in the real-world setting, with the fact that usually uh, they uh, consume it uh, with added sugars, uh, dry f fruit, uh, or honey, or uh, high-fat uh, high dairy products? And do you agree with me that maybe the best way to consume it with a little bit of nuts, berries, and uh, uh, low-fat dairy? products or water? Right, so if I, I did um, very quickly um, at the beginning to present a meta-analysis of the uh, uh, findings on oaks included. It's mainly whole grain. Um, uh, oak is just part of it. So I'm kind of uh, reluctant to, to uh, jump to, again, oak again. Though that said, it does have a lot of the small-scale um, randomized trials showing a, an effect, which is minor. It, it makes sense to me how in a, in, I, I'm not surprised with that finding, why? Because just think about it. I mean, I, I imagine it, this study is done in a free living human, 
How could it be possible? Um, every this person engaged in their daily life without major change in energy deficiency, they will lose weight. That's a miracle. I mean, it's against uh, a physical law, right? So it has somehow that person exercise and, 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 and reduce caloric consumption in that way that would lose some weight. So if you only think about that, it makes total sense. Uh, those data are, in fact, in my view, super consistent. Yeah, well, the question was whether it was bad to eat oatmeal with sugar. Um, I mean, my reading literature is the only signal for weight uh, with sugar is for sugar-sweetened beverages, and that if you consume foods like yogurt or breakfast cereals, which are often sweetened, those actually demonstrate or are associated with weight loss or, or lower weight. So I don't think it's bad to have a, a little bit of uh, sugar helps the medicine go down, as it were. I can't resist commenting on that. <laughs> I mean, we could go on all day about this, but I will just, Tom starts off by saying um, that, you know, a, a, a little bit of sugar, you ended up by saying a little bit of sugar, but the sentence before said it was okay to have. So I think you've really got to be very careful. It depends. I mean, sugar is a form of calories. And I mean, we published our first paper on this in 1972, uh, to be precise, it was published in December 72 in The Lancet, where we said if, we, if you tell people to reduce sugar and give up sugar, they, they, they do lose weight. So while I firmly believe that if you do a caloric exchange, then obviously it's not going to make much any difference. But for many people, uh, giving up sugar or using sugar is not calorically exchanged. And I think that's where you run into problems. I mean, there are endless meta-analyses which show that exchange it isocalorically and it's not a problem. But most people don't exchange it isocalorically. I, too, have sugar on my oatmeal uh, porridge. But you, just for a moment, imagine this. Imagine a scenario that someone like my wife, who really enjoys sugar, have a sugar tea. If you make her cut down sugar, and her stress level goes up, and then think about it, right? Stress level goes up, and then as endocrinology, we all know what that happened. It's just destiny to gain weight. Seriously, so I just go ahead and have that sugar. Uh, See, so if it's not nutrition is a very complex issue because it has to do with the life of people, which is complex. So uh, I, on behalf of my co-chair co person, I will uh, ask uh, the, the the people now to have time for relaxing, not too much. One hour we shall convene at two o'clock here. Thanks to the speakers, to the audience, and to all the people who have participated in the discussion. See you later.